Good evening. My name is Dr. Matthew Moynihan, and I'm an expert in nuclear fusion research. I worked for six and a half years on inertial confinement fusion. Just think about the Death Star, where they had all the laser beams con condensing. That's basically what inertial confinement fusion is. I got my PhD at the University of Rochester, and we have this Omega Laser facility. That's a picture of it on the left. It's 60 laser beams that condense on a target, so a pellet of fusion fuel in the center. And there, when it happens, there's an explosion of energy outward and an equal and opposite compression wave inward that compresses the, t the target down to fusion conditions. That's a picture of me on the right during graduate school. This was, I think, 2012. Uh, after graduating, I've done a number of things. I created the Fusion podcast. I have a Fusion blog. I was part of a Fusion startup team. And I'm currently developing a book with my co-author, Fred Bortz, who's sitting in the back there. Hey, Fred. Anyway, Fusion's a really big topic, and we don't have enough time to cover the whole thing. So what I've done in this presentation is I'm going to give you 10 things you should know about nuclear fusion. And feel free to ask questions after each one. And we're just going to kind of go through this. So this is the 10 things you should know. Uh, first, does anyone know when fusion first occurred? Or when we first discovered fusion? Does anyone want to guess? Okay, well, it's 1933. In 1933, in England, uh, this fella over here on the left, Dr. Mark Oliphant, he was working in Ernest Rutherford's lab. So this is a picture of Ernest Rutherford's lab. And what he did was he created a particle accelerator. So think of CERN. And he got particles going really, really fast at high speeds, about 600,000 uh, volts. And then he slammed them into a droplet of heavy water. So he discovered, eventually, they discovered uh, three fusion reactions, and they're shown up there in the upper right. Uh, they are deuterium, deuterium tritium, and deuterium helium-3. Helium-3 you can mine off the moon. So these are different fuels. If you think about a fusion power plant compared to your car, you have three grades of gasoline that you can fuel your car up with. You have three fuel options when you go with a nuclear fusion power plant. And you can measure the fusibility using something called the cross section. This is down in the lower right. And it's uh, dependent on how hard these two atoms hit and if they hit head on or not. You can measure how much fusion reactions you're going to get. And a lot of times they scatter. So the scattering cross section is what you're fighting against. Scattering is much more common than fusion. Anyone want to guess what the next important date in fusion is? It's about 20 years in the future. The IV mic test. November 1st, 1952. This was a bomb test in the MOE Talk Atoll in the South Pacific. The United States conducted this test and it was the first hydrogen device. So it was the first atomic bomb that was strong enough and powerful enough to get fusion reactions. But of course, a bomb doesn't work as a power plant. We need to be able to do fusion in a building and not be able to kill ourselves when we do it. So in the 1950s, three nations were racing to try to get fusion simultaneously. The United States, the United Kingdom, and Russia. Argentina came out and famously claimed that they had done it, and that turned out to be an international embarrassment. And then a few years later, the United Kingdom came out and said that they had done it, but they were also proven wrong. And then a few months after that, the United States did it. We were the first. We were the first nation to have nuclear fusion in uh, basically a room. And the way we did it was we did it with a pinch. Now, this is a picture. The black and white photo on the right is a picture of the lab that did it. The machine that did it was called Scalia 1. It was a theta pinch machine. But a basic pinch is you have a tube of deuterium, metal tube, and you dump current down the sides of the tube. And when you do that, you get a strong magnetic inward force, which crushes the tube and causes the atoms to fuse. So you can see that, that step by step on the bottom left. Oh, incidentally, few pinches were part of the movie Ocean's Eleven. So in the movie, uh, they tried to knock out the power to the casino, and they had to knock out all the power around the casino. 
but they couldn't do it. So they, they went and stole the pinch machine. And Don Cheadle's character here is is scarily pressing the go button on the pinch machine. So I thought I'd throw that photo in. Okay, so number eight, we know how to make it work. We've known for a long time how to make it work. We can do fusion. For six decades, we've been able to do it. What we can't do is get more power out than we put in. That is elusive. And that is essentially the liftoff point. That's the Kitty Hawk moment for fusion. That's the plane taking off on the beaches of North Carolina. And if once that happens, the fusion power industry can really start to get going. So the world record right now is held by the joint European Taurus. In 1997, they pulled 16 megawatts of electrical energy from a fusion reaction. And they fed in uh, 24 megawatts to heat the plasma. They have the world record for the highest extraction of electrical energy from nuclear fusion. To get net power, what we need to do is we need to beat the Lawson energy balance. So this is a picture of John Lawson on the left. He was an engineer in the 1950s in England. And being an engineer, he applied an energy balance across a plasma device. So think of the sun. The sun loses energy two ways. First, it sends out light obviously, from its surface. And that's the radiation losses. And then it also loses particles. It loses mass. So that's conduction losses. And then it generates energy through fusion that happens inside the depths of the sun. So if you think about the sun as a fusion reactor, it has a fusion rate minus mass loss conduction, minus light loss radiation. And of course, we have a, an efficiency term because we've got a power plan associated with it. We've got some efficiency for how our machine works. So net power equals fusion minus conduction minus radiation times efficiency. Make this equation positive and you'll change the world. No one's been able to do it, not anywhere in the world, not in the last six decades or more. And if we do it, we change the course of human history. Number eight, you can do fusion in your home. I know that sounds a little crazy, but you can do it. You can build a thing called a fuser. That, that's pictured right there in the center. A fuser is a wire cage inside a wire cage inside a vacuum chamber. And you apply a voltage between the inner and outer cage. You make the inner cage negative. About 10,000 volts is what you need. Then you can go on, on the internet and buy deuterium gas. So a water bottle sized deuterium gas, running you about 100 bucks. And then you pump in your deuterium gas into your chamber. And what happens is that the gas ionizes because it feels the voltage drop. And it sees that negative cage in the center and it falls towards it. And as it falls, it builds up speed. Now, most of the ions hit the metal cage, which at high voltages will actually melt. But if they miss, they can hit in the center and fuse. So you can get fusion with your little fuser for maybe two, three thousand dollars first amateur was uh, Richard Hull. This is a picture of him on the right. He did this in 1999 in his shed in Virginia, outside Richmond, Virginia. And since then, Richard has run Fuser.net, which is a community of people that build these Fuser devices. And th through that community, about 100 teenagers or more have done nuclear fusion. The most famous one was Taylor Wilson here on the upper left. He fused the atom at 14 in 2008, and he's given two TED Talks, and a book was written about him, and they invited him to the White House Science Fair, so here he is presenting to Barack Obama. Right now, the current record is held by a 12-year-old in Tennessee. He's the currently the youngest person to ever do fusion. In Seattle, a fellow named Carl Greninger, who's pictured here in the right, he decided to take this fusion device and turn it into a high school fusion club. So he built this machine in his garage, and he started inviting high school kids over every Friday to do nuclear fusion experiments, and then they go out and they crush at science fairs. So his kids have won uh, local, state, national, and international science competitions. And collectively, the kids have won over $600,000 in college scholarships. So it's really exciting. And uh, we should see more of this activity at the high school level. Okay, number seven. U.S. has funded fusion for really only about 15 years. 
Was anyone here alive during the oil crisis? Yeah, the oil crisis was scary for America. Put a great deal of pressure on the Carter administration to do something about energy. And so uh, Jimmy Carter dumped a ton of money into energy programs. On the right, you'll see a, a plot of the fusion energy budget. And you'll see that in the mid-70s, it shoots way, way up. And then it's high through the early 80s and then comes down. We really funded fusion during this time. We funded it for energy crisis, but we also funded it to stay ahead of the Soviets during the Cold War. So I say we funded fusion, but relative to other things, we haven't really put a lot of money into fusion. For instance, compared to the NASA budget, you'll see the NASA budget here on the left. The fusion budget fits in this little blue box down at the bottom, and NASA's obviously gotten a great deal more. So we haven't really funded fusion, except for this brief period in time called the golden age of nuclear fusion. Now, during the golden age of nuclear fusion, a lot of diversity was seen in the fusion space. There were a lot of different ideas that were tried. Probably the biggest one was the mirror machine. This is a picture of mirrors up here on the right. The idea of the mirror is to have two plasma mirrors face one another, and then you have plasma bounce around back and forth between the two mirrors. And hopefully they collide in the center and they fuse. The ends of the mirrors were pretty hard to dam up, so a number of different magnetic designs were tried. You'll see them pictured down here on the left to pl plug up the end of the mirror. And this program lasted for 15 years, and a number of machines were built, probably a dozen or so. And it all culminated in the Magnetic Mirror Test Facility, the MFTF, which was the largest, most expensive machine ever built at Livermore to that point. $372 million on the machine. This machine was opened on February 21st, 1986, and then immediately shut down. They closed it down. They never turned it on. It was really, really unfortunate. So the fall of the Mirror program and the end of U.S. funding of fusion significantly marked the rise of the tokamak and laser fusion as the two dominant approaches. But if you go back in history and you look at the last six decades, you realize that there were a lot of fusion approaches, a lot more than just the ones that you've heard of. There are many fusion approaches. And this is an outdated chart, and it's got a number of flaws with it, but I just put it up because I don't have anything better at the moment. But it shows all these different approaches and how they're related. So for instance, there are four kinds of stellarators that exist, and only maybe one of them has really been built in Germany. There's a variety of different pinch machines. There's a variety of inertial confinement machines. There's four or five different kinds. There are a variety of self-structured things like Spheromax and field reverse configurations. So all of these ideas are out there and they really haven't been tested by the federal government. Some of them are old and maybe if you looked at them again today with our new technology, they show a lot of promise. I mean, none of them are perfect. They all have flaws and none of them are really winners, except for maybe the tokamak, which is the most mature of all of these. But there's a lot of diversity out there. And there's a lot of things that are just haven't really been tested. Number five, fusion startups are real. There are a number of fusion startups in this space now, and I'm going to talk about a few in a couple of slides. But I'm going to tell you the story of one of them, General Fusion. General Fusion was started in 2002 by Michel Labarge uh, as a physicist. He's up here on the left with one of his early partners. Labarge was working at a printing company and he had a midlife crisis and he decided to just change the direction of his life. So he took the $400,000 or so that he had from his previous job and quit his job and rented this old, uh, I guess, mechanic shop down here and followed this approach called magnetic liner fusion. Let me explain. General Fusion takes a sphere of hot plasma that's rotating and injects it in the middle of a big chamber and surrounds it with liquid lead lithium. And then they use pistons, really cheap, simple pistons, to compress the liquid metal, which would then compress the plasma and cause it to fuse. So they have this liquid metal, which is the working fluid, which absorbs all the neutrons and all the energy off of it. And so Labarge came up with this idea. He built this little prototype. There's a picture of the prototype. He's got his hand on it up here on the left. And he got neutrons and found investors and raised some money and started really building up this company. So that's 17 years ago. And today, this is what General Fusion has been able to accomplish. 
They have a large staff. This picture is a few years old, but it's a pretty big staff. They've developed a prototype uh, that's in the background of one of these pictures with 14 pistons. And this is a recent photo, maybe a couple months old, of their prototype with maybe 220 pistons that they're testing. They've also gotten some recognition from some powerful individuals. Uh, this is a picture of Justin Trudeau at General Fusion. The Canadian government in the fall of 2018 gave them about $50 million for investments. They've also got collaborations with Microsoft. It's a pretty exciting company, and it's the kind of thing that can happen in the fusion space when investors and technologists are willing to take a chance and work together. So, in fact, this is a, a photo of all the different uh, logos from the different fusion startups that are out there under the Fusion Industry Association. This is an, a U.S. umbrella group in Washington, D.C. that's supposed to represent these companies to the federal government. There's also two companies that, three companies here that aren't part of this FIA group. Phoenix Nuclear Labs, they develop a neutron generator based on fusion. They have some really awesome, awesome technology. And then their sister company, Shine, takes that neutron generator and uses it to make radioactive isotopes. They're both in Janesville, Wisconsin, which is super cool. Then up in the corner left, there's this uh, First Light Fusion. That's a group out of England. They raised a lot of money, like 100 million, something on the order of that uh, in investment. And they're spin out from Oxford. And then on the right, we got uh, the, the Flowing Z Pinch group, Uri Shermalock's group at the University of Washington. They have a really interesting concept. And then down below, this is the staff of Tokamak Energy, but this is a couple years old. This might be from 2012, maybe. And it's a small group. They're much larger now. They're up to 60 people, and they have a number of very cool milestones. They just hit 15 million degrees C, and they've run their tokamak for 26 hours continuously. So they have two major milestones on their resume. So there's a budding little group of startups here, and we've we've grown quite a bit in the last five years. We've seen investment grow up past probably 1.5 billion dollars, with maybe staff numbers in the several hundreds now. So the space is getting really exciting. Number four, we need a pipeline. This is more for the government side of things. We need to fund a pipeline of fusion approaches. We need maybe 20 approaches at the low end. So maybe 20 approaches where you give them a couple million a year and you keep the team small. And then we need probably eight middle funded groups that you give eight to 10 million. And then on the top end, we need three big approaches that you fund in, on the order of 100 to 150 million a year. So you could still do ITER in this structure and you could still do NIF, but then you could add all these new ideas and you, you could tie the funding to the risk profile geared around the power plant approach. So if a machine can run longer or it's easier to maintain or it has a lower final cost, or it has a better efficiency, the team should be able to move up or down the scale based on how close they are to the power plant. So pipeline approaches to funding are not new. They're used in biotech and pharmaceutical companies. We need to apply that model here to fusion. And once we do that, I think we're going to make a lot more progress a lot quicker. The U.S. needs to seriously be looking at this. They need to be looking at it because China is definitely interested. And they have made a lot of aggressive moves in the last five years that U.S. politicians don't seem to have noticed. There's both private and public interest from China. So on the public side, they have this INEST office in Haifei, which is a fusion fission research office out of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And this is a picture of their staff from probably three years ago. They have about four to 500 PhDs with an average age of 31 or 32. And they're looking at both advanced fission, so molten salt reactors, pebble bed reactors, new fuel cycles, thorium stuff. And they're also looking at fusion approaches. So they're supporting ITER, but they're also looking at neutron sources and a number of other interesting fusion ideas. Now, on the public side, there are private companies in China that are interested in fusion. Down here on the bottom right is the CEO of ENN. ENN is a Chinese oil and gas company. This man is worth about 2.2 billion yuan, and he's made a very innovative energy company that pursues wind and solar and a bunch of other things. And very recently, their company has gotten into fusion. They went to Princeton and they met Sam Cohen, Professor Sam Cohen, 
pictured on the lower left, he has a field reverse configuration machine. And his budgets have been low and his staffing numbers have been low for about a decade. Well, when China heard about his approach and the fact that he has the world record for the longest stable FRC ever created, they funded him. They hired a staff of 30 people and they gave him roughly 10 million. And they're trying to build a duplicate Rotomac machine over in China. And in May of 2019, they're going to host an international alternative fusion conference. And they've brought a number of U.S. fusion researchers over there. And the U.S. hasn't funded these guys. So they're going over to China to look for the money. And China's going to gobble up every single idea that the U.S. has failed to fund for the last decade. So it's very, very alarming. And the U.S. policymakers need to pay attention to this. Okay, number two. There are some innovations happening in fusion, and the biggest one, I think, is high-temperature superconductors. High-temperature superconductors have been developing outside of the fusion world, and we're starting to see them come into the fusion world in a big way. And they enable really high, powerful magnetic fields at reasonable temperatures. When you think about what that will enable for fusion, it's pretty stark because the fusion rate scales roughly as the field strength to the fourth power. So if you can take a superconductor and you can go from a one Tesla field to a 10 Tesla field, you can increase your fusion rate by an exponential of four. And a number of companies are making this pitch, most notably uh, Commonwealth Fusion Systems out of MIT. They are going after a high temperature superconductor design. And they recently raised about 70 million from an, an Italian oil company and the Breakthrough Energy Ventures Institute. Superconductors are a huge deal and they are gonna be a game changer in this space. Okay, last but not least, climate change is not waiting. Fusion power has the capacity to be cheap, clean, abundant green energy for all mankind, foreseeable future. And if we can harness this power source, it will be a game changer for our civilization. So we need to move and we need to move quickly on this if we wanna stave off the worst effects of climate change. It's not like it replaces wind and solar, it augments wind and solar, it augments geothermal, it augments all these other green technologies. But if we add fusion to the mix, we could really make an impact on our carbon footprint. Thank you.